Hello everyone, Gilly here. In the last video I made, I used Python to implement a kind of weak but useful breadth-first search algorithm to solve Advent of Code Day 24 Part 1 um, from 2016. Today I'm going to do the exact same thing, except I'm not going to actually solve the full problem. I'm just going to do the breadth-first search and parsing parts of the problem. But I'm going to do it in Haskell today, and I'm going to write it in a pure functional way, as one does in Haskell. And just, I'm kind of doing this mainly to contrast the uh, Python version, which, you know, is an imperative style, with the Haskell style, and show that in a lot of ways they're really not hideously different. And even algorithms like this lend themselves really well, actually especially algorithms like this, lend themselves really well to functional programming patterns and paradigms. So really quickly to reiterate the problem, basically we're given a grid of data and the grid has these numbers on it and there's also these dots which indicate paths that we're allowed to take and there's these hash characters which indicate walls that we're not allowed to step over and the overall problem wants you to know how what the shortest path is through all the numbers in this case it happens to be 0 to 4 4 to 1 1 to 2 and then 2 to 3 um, but in this problem I'm not going to solve the shortest path problem. I'm not going to solve the overall shortest path problem. We're just going to solve the small shortest path problem, finding the shortest path, for example, from 0 to 3, or from 0 to 1. So that's the plan for this video. Um, so if you haven't seen the Python video and you'd like to watch it, go ahead. Um, but anyways, we're going to do it in Haskell this time around. So here I have breadth first search Haskell. And here I have a small input. This is the small example. The larger example is uh, much crazier, but we'll just use the small one for now. This solution should work for the large one as well. So in Haskell, we start out by saying module main, which will contain our actual code. Now there are three structures that I'm gonna use, three collections types that I'm gonna use to uh, actually implement this. So we're gonna import qualified data.sequence as seek, and I'm going to use a sequence to represent the to try list, or in other words, as we're searching, things that we have to try to investigate later are going to be stored in this sequence, because it, basically because it makes a nice uh, in-memory queue. So data.set, I'm going to import as s, and these will get confusing. I'm sorry about that. I don't really know a much better way to structure it, honestly. Um, data.map.strict as m. So we're just going to import these things, and they're going to be qualified such that we have to reference them by their aliases, which is the as part. So I'm also going to create a type to represent positions, and positions are just going to be a tuple of x, y coordinates. So in the last problem, the way I solved it was the first thing I did was I parsed out all of the positions, which I called spots, and I parsed out a lookup from our numbers in the problem because we actually care about these numbers and how to get to other numbers and we're allowed to step over numbers. Um, I parsed those things out. So we're actually going to do a lookup from a number to its position. So we're actually going to do the same thing here. So spots and positions is going to be a function which is going to take in a string. So it's going to take in the text of our board and it's going to return back a set of position as well as a map from a number, so one of our numbers here, is, in this case 0 to 4, to position. So where does that number exist in the board? So it's going to take in some text. And then all we're going to do here is we're going to do a fold. And we're going to accumulate values as we go, starting with an empty set and an empty map. And we're going to fold over the list of pairs and values, so uh, position value pairs specifically. So first we can extract, we're using do notation here to loop over these values. So um, we're going to zip from zero all the way up lines of text. So breaking this apart, first we're going to convert the text into a list of lines, and then we're going to zip those lines with the um, index, indexes of the positions. And 
really starting at zero here is totally arbitrary. The solution will work no matter what you put as the first index here. You can put totally anything you like. It should still work. It doesn't really matter because it's all kind of relative. If this was 50-50, you know, then this would be 51-50. Um, it's still one away. So we're going to do the same thing for x values, except at this point we have a cell value, and we're going to zip line. And again, it doesn't actually matter how we index these. Basically, this, if you look back to the last video I made, this looks a lot like the nested for reaches. It's very similar. It's kind of the same concept, really. Um, and then here we're going to actually return back our values. And again, this is going to be a pair of the position, so the xy pairing and the cell. So now we have to define the accumulator. So we can say where accum. <clears throat> And here we do a couple of things. If we're accumulating and we get some point and we get a dot, well, we're also going to get spots and positions. And what we're going to do is we're just going to insert that current position or that current spot into the spots. And we're not going to change positions because this isn't a number. So again, positions is a map from a number to its actual location. So if we get anything else, we're going to have to be a little more clever. And I'm actually going to use an alias here on this type, which will just let me reference it in a moment using R to reference this whole thing. And I'm going to say if the value that we're looking at is an element of numbers in this problem, they only go 0 to 9. Then we want to do something else. We want to return back r. So if the value is a number, then what we want to do is we want to insert the position into the spot again. And then what we want to do is we want to m.insert <clears throat> into positions the key of reading the value. Now, this might be a little bit confusing. And technically, um, this is safe by convention. You can tell it's safe because this uh, element check will make sure that it can read as an int. But if you just saw this code floating around, it wouldn't necessarily be safe because you can't necessarily always read a value um, from a string. You can't necessarily always read a number or an int from a string. But what I'm going to show you is what's happening here. So if you had a character, let's say um, 5, to make it into a string in Haskell, strings are just lists of characters. We can just put a list around that. So that's what we're doing there. And then read will parse it to something else. But the problem is read has no idea what to parse it to here. So we're going to say, hey, read us an int. Um, of course, in my actual code here, since we're talking about ints via positions, Haskell can just kind of go and infer all of that for us. So this is what it takes to actually parse. Let me, um, as I'm going, let me just run this to make sure I haven't done anything silly. And I haven't, it's just complaining that main doesn't exist, which is okay, because we haven't written it yet. So the next thing we went on to write in the Python version is we went on to write around, which around basically took a set of positions. And in the Python version, we didn't actually inject this. We just referenced it in scope. In this case, we're going to pass it down to the function, because you'll see it plays out a little more nicely. And then we're going to take back a position also. And we're just going to return back all of the positions that are valid around that position. So if this was a cell in the middle, um, its neighbors, if they were all dots or numbers, would all be valid around it. Um, this is going to tell us what's actually valid, what's not a hash character that we're not allowed to visit. And as you'll see in a moment, it'll tell us a little bit more too. So this is around, and we're going to take in what's actually valid, and we're going to take in... Um, our actual point, which we're just destructuring right there. So then what we're going to do is we're going to filter s.member valid. And actually, when you call member, you need to put the value first, which means this isn't going to work. Now, in Haskell, you can use backticks to effectively flip the function. So that'll let us put the set as the first argument. And here we're going to do the same thing we did before. We're just going to say this is x plus 1, y, x minus 1, y, x, y, plus 1, and then x, y, minus 1. So this came out really nice in my opinion. So we're going to filter 
the list of things that could potentially be around the ones that are actually valid to be around. So that's kind of cool, not too bad. Um, and that's about it until we get to the actual breadth of first search algorithm. So here we go. So dist is going to be our breadth of first search algorithm, and it's going to return the distance between two points. So it's going to take in our earlier determined set of positions to m map of int position. So it's going to take back. It's going to return. It's going to take in our spots and our positions. And then it's going to take in some point that we're starting at. And then it's going to take in some point that we want to end at. And one thing we're going to do differently than the Python version is we're going to return back a maybe int. And this is a little bit better. This is a little more safe. Because in reality, um, if we we're given just any old input, we could have something like this, um, where this is a hash and this is a hash. And then there's no way to get, say, from 0 to 3. Um, that's perfectly valid as far as input's concerned. In advent of code, Unless otherwise stated, they tend to give you valid inputs, but in reality that might not happen, so we have to account for it with maybe, which is really just another way here to say no path exists. We weren't able to find a path from, say, 0 to 3. <clears throat> so dist is going to take in, as I said, spots and positions, and then it's going to take in some source and it's going to take in some dest. And now we're going to use do again here, uh, do syntax, and the nice thing about do syntax is that it works on any monad in Haskell. So we used it for lists earlier, and now I'm going to use it for maybe. So to get the actual source, we're going to do an m.lookup, a map lookup of source and positions. And then to get the actual destination, which I'm going to rename as sot, so source and sot are what we're seeking after, we look up the dest in positions. And then what we're going to do is we're just going to delegate to a helper function, which is going to be called actual search, do the search for me. And that's going to have to take in the sot value. And also, we're going to pass two things, exactly like we did in the Python version. We're going to pass what we've already visited. And we're also going to pass what we have to try. Um, or maybe to visit is a better word. So we're going to pass what we've already seen. We shouldn't look where we've already looked. It's a waste of time. And will end in infinite recursion. And we also have to pass what else we have to check around where we've already checked. So visited is going to start as a set singleton. So a singleton function just builds um, the value that it's constructing with one element in it. So this will build a set with one element, and that element is source. So we've already visited source because we're going to build a seek.singleton of the source and zero as a pair. So search, if you look at its type, it's going to take in a set of what we've already seen and then a sequence of things that we still have to try. So positions we haven't um, yet really investigated or investigated their neighbors and uh, how far away they are from source. So z source is zero from source. So what does our actual search look like? Well, our actual search as I said, it's going to take in what we've already visited. It's going to take in to try or to visit. I'll call this to visit. That's probably a better name. And then it's going to take in the sot value. Now, I wish in Haskell there was a way to just reuse this name down here in this where scope. You can reuse names up here, but you can't reuse ones that are bound in do notation. There might be an extension for that. That's kind of the Haskell answer you tend to see is there's an extension for that. But it, that's neither here nor there. So what we're going to do is we're going to use case seek.view l to visit of. So what view l does, I'm going to pull it up right now. View l is a way to essentially take the first value off of our queue. Um, first, our queue is um, first in, first out, basically. So what we're going to do is view l, we'll turn back either an empty l or the head of the list, the first element of the queue, the, the one we have to pull, um, and the rest of the elements. So the cases then actually look like empty L. And if we get an empty left, well, basically that means we found no elements. We have nothing left to try. We've exhausted all of our possibilities. This is a nothing. And we have to say seek dot because we namespaced everything as seek. 
So next we have to go and we have to actually say what the value is. So this is seek dot, whatever this little symbol is, which is kind of cool looking, colon arrow, rest. Yeah, that's what we want. And then this is gonna be, basically we can destructure this right here, which is another sweet thing about Haskell pattern matching. So here we're just pulling out the thing we're currently trying and its current distance, basically. So basically what we wanna say is if we're at what we're seeking, so if we're at the SOT value, then we found it in the distances where we are. Otherwise, what we wanna do is we wanna search again but we wanna track some new visited values. So I'll say visited prime. And we also wanna say the rest of the values, which is this value up here, um, should be appended to or concatenated with is probably a better way to say it. Some more that we have to try, more to try, more to visit later. And of course we have to recurse and pass sot down. So let's go ahead and build up these couple of missing values. So we'll use let here. So we can say let in. So basically, first let's get the neighbors. So the neighbors are gonna be around where we're currently at. And this is kind of the cool part. Um, you almost wanna just say spots here. But what we can do is we can use set difference to say we want the things that are around us that are spots that have not already been visited. So basically this is gonna get the neighbors that we haven't seen already. Super cool. And then we're gonna, we have to adjust our visited. We have to add new things to it and that's gonna be the union of visited and set from list of neighbors. So we have to add all of the neighbors that we're gonna look at now to, be, to the list of things that we've already visited. So and then in the end, we just say more to try. So what else do we have to try in addition to rest here? Just to keep our queue in the right way, keep our queue in the right order. We're gonna use seek that from list. <clears throat> and this is going to basically take our neighbors. And what we're gonna to wanna to do is we're just gonna to wanna to map a neighbor and say neighbor and then D plus one. So the idea here is all of our neighbors are one more away from uh, the step that we just took, basically. So if we're at if we're at some position here, let's let's play an example. If we're at this position, um, however many steps we took to get here, this is one more away. For example. Um, so I think that's actually it. Let me go ahead and just run this and make sure it's still failing for the same reason it is. So now we need to write a little bit more boilerplate, but basically that's it. This is our breadth first search. Um, as in the Python example, we can modify it to become more robust. This version is safer because it doesn't just assume every path exists, as we'll see in a moment. So basically what we can do is we can read in the text of the file. So we'll read in and put dot text. And then what we'll do is we'll just print out the distance um, of spots and positions of the text. And let's just try zero to three first. So zero to three, this one was 10 if I remember correctly. So if we run it, we get back just 10, wonderful. So now just for fun, let's go ahead and let's block the path. There should be no way from zero to three now. Oops, I ran the wrong file. Yep, nothing, that's cool. Uh, let's go ahead and let's try to make life a little different for the puzzle for this problem. Um, let's just move, I don't know, what's something fun we could do here? We could um, make a new, let's put three, three here, so that it's not 10 away. Um, and then let's see what that does. That should take the short path right around the corner here, so it should go five. One, two, three, four, five, yep. But if we do this, it should have to take a long path all the way around, roughly, I don't know, 15. Yep, 15. Awesome. Cool. So that's it. Uh, hopefully this was useful to you. I think it's exceptionally kind of cool to do it in a functional style. And I think it, I really do think this problem lends itself well to a functional style. I think that seek is a nice way in Haskell to represent a queue. And uh, thanks for watching.